Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth. On Now You Know. We're brought to you by abetterrootplanner.com, our favorite EV trip planner with waypoints. Use our link in the show notes below to get a 30-day free trial to the A Better Root Planner premium app. Plan your next EV trip with abetterrootplanner.com. And we're sponsored by BigBattery.com with the best battery prices in the USA, guaranteed. If you've got something you need to power from homes to cars, RVs to boats, and much more, BigBattery.com has you covered, offering the newest battery tech. Use the code now you know to save 5% off your purchase today at BigBattery.com. So I thought we'd start the new year talking about an electric car company that's not exactly new, but it's kind of new. So is it new or is it not new? Well... It's a startup, and it's new, I guess you'd say, but, um, well, the name of the company is Aptera. It's based in San Diego, and we just spoke to their co-CEOs, and I'm actually so intrigued by their new EV that I pre-ordered one. So, let's dive in. Now, to be honest, I was skeptical about Aptera. Yeah, I mean, I faintly remember the original company, Aptera Motors Incorporated, was founded in 2005 and made some big promises, and then it went bankrupt in 2011. And before we go any further, I think we should hear from Steve and Chris, their co-CEOs, about what they have to say about this. Chris and I started Aptera back in 2006. Um, it started as a project in my garage, something to keep me busy and to make an electric vehicle. We raised about $40 million of funding. We built the prototypes that you saw. We hired a, a professional management team from Detroit. And um, about a year after that, Chris and I left the company just because we had a, a difference of direction that we wanted to take. Uh, so Chris started Flux Power, a uh, battery company. He'll tell you about that. And I got into vertical farming. Uh, I created a company called Fambro that took me to the Middle East for two years with my family. I came back and uh, Chris approached me about restarting Aptera. And, and the rest is history. Yeah, so it's interesting to me because if I was going to restart a company after my first one had gone bankrupt, and I'm not blaming them, it sounds like things just went wrong as things can do, I would have renamed the company and kind of started with the fresh slate. But because they used the name Aptera again, uh, I, like many others out there, associated it with the previous company and was already kind of jaded. Yeah, I think it's confusing for most people. There are some people who were Aptera's ardent fans uh, who have come back and kind of knew to come back because, well, it's still Aptera. And they kind of got a bum deal in a way because they were going for that DOE loan and the DOE loan said in it, if you're a car company, we can loan you money. And then somewhere in the fine print of the loan, it said you have to be making a four-wheel car and they were making a three-wheel car. So yeah, that kind of stinks for anyone who's making a two, three, five, six wheel electric vehicle. It, it's weird that that was a part of the legislation. Now, has that changed? So in 2009, Aptera lobbied the DOE to change the language. It sounds like they did actually update the language to allow them to get the loan. But by that time, uh, Aptera had a new CEO and it just didn't sound like things were meshing. So um, Chris and Steve left the company. And What's weird that follows is that the IP of the company got sold off during the bankruptcy to a Chinese firm. And what we're hearing now is that basically Chris and Steve bought back the IP, which was the important part of this whole story. Uh, what we're going to get into is that Chris and Steve approached making an electric car kind of like Elon did. He went, They went back to first principles and came up with some intellectual property that was very important to making that car work. But one of the other things that jaded me about Aptera and one of the reasons why I just, I don't know, didn't really dive into it that much in the beginning was because their original car was going to be a hybrid. And this makes sense because back in 2006, trying to come up with an all electric car with, you know, the battery tech wasn't there yet, um, didn't make a whole lot of sense. It was crazy. It, you wouldn't you wouldn't consider doing it. Well, um, <laughs> Tesla did. Yeah, but they didn't actually really get going uh, in 2006. Yeah. And, and I mean, Aptera was promising a 300 mile per gallon hybrid car, which sounded pretty good. It had 120 miles of electric range. But again, you know how I feel about hybrids. So that's why I just kind of lost interest in this company. But let's fast forward to today. In 2019, Chris and Steve restarted the company, um, this time to make a solar electric vehicle or an SEV. And so you might be saying I'm familiar with plug-in hybrids. I'm familiar with battery electric vehicles. I've heard of fuel cell electric vehicles. What is an SEV? And there's only a couple other companies I can think of that are going in this direction. Uh, Sono Motors and Lightyear, which are putting solar on the car. But we've heard from Elon, like, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't put solar on the car. It doesn't make any sense. And that's another reason why I was like, oh, Aptera doesn't make any sense. Right. But 
Uh, let's talk to Steve and Chris and find out if that is a good idea or not. Yeah, 700 watts of solar production uh, really adds up. So, you know, if you can produce more than four kilowatt hours a day, that can take you more than 40 miles a day. The average North American driver drives about 31 miles a day. In Europe, they drive about 26 miles a day. So for the average consumer, you could buy an Aptera that you never have to plug in unless you want to go on a long trip. Um, so, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's pretty exciting to have the technology on the vehicle. There's also a conversion loss issue. If you're producing solar power at home, you're converting that, storing that, and then you'd have to reconvert it to charge your vehicle. The thinking of moving, moving the needle, moving the engineering needle in terms of orders of magnitude, it came from my, my old boss uh, at Illumina, the biotech company I worked at. And so he always challenged us to, we thought about saving the cost or improving the, the time on a certain step with the robot to, not think about five or ten percent, but how do you how do you change something by an order of magnitude? And so that was a thought exercise that we started with the drag coefficient. So how do we make mathematically, you know, the, the CD times A go to zero? Well, can't really make it go to zero, but can we lower it almost an order of magnitude or maybe a factor of five? And that thinking just it pays off in so many other areas of the vehicle because then you need less structure, you need less weight. That means you need less batteries, which again are less weight, et cetera, et cetera. But I think who's really going to appreciate the low drag are the, the customers in Germany uh, because, you know, the losses are exponential uh, as you go up in speed. So we're doing the EPA highway driving cycle here and everybody's comparing that to the EPA highway driving cycle, which is average 49 miles an hour. You imagine driving 80, 90 miles an hour and the differences in range are going to be profound between uh, this vehicle and any other EV. OK, so huge difference here. When you have a car with a super efficient powertrain, then putting solar panels on the roof makes sense. Why? So when Elon says it doesn't make sense to put solar on the car, he's not saying that the solar panels wouldn't generate energy and it wouldn't charge the battery. But what he is saying is that it would be such a small amount of energy that it wouldn't contribute very much to the range of the vehicle over any reasonable period of time, right? right. If you were to cover a Model uh, you know, S in solar, it would take you, I think, around a month to charge your car, which just isn't very practical and every day you'd only be getting a, you know a few miles of range if you were lucky but if you have a car that uses one quarter of the energy to propel itself forward uh well suddenly all the solar that you collect has a quadrupling effect on the range yeah let's look at some numbers so if the aptera can get an extra 40 miles of range a day from just its solar that would mean that something like a tesla model s would get about 10 to 15 miles and so even though 10 to 15 miles isn't bad uh 40 miles is amazing. And I mean, as they mentioned, 40 miles is pretty close to an average commute for most people, which means that you might not need to plug in the vehicle to charge. Right. Yeah. And I want to get back to the tech of the vehicle here. Um, the reason why it looks so weird is because the car is basically driving through soup every day. It's not driving through soup. It's driving through air. But air is a fluid. You might be saying like, well, there's nothing in this room. <laughs> well, actually, it's full of air. Uh, the air is in the way. And that is why you can't just start driving and go a million miles an hour. It's because the air is what's slowing you down. Yeah, I mean, I've learned so much this year uh, trying to get up Pike's Peak with the Model 3, learning about air resistance and how important it is to this whole equation. And so as they're pointing out here, so the drag on a car is related to the square of the velocity. So as you go faster and faster, there's more and more air resistance on the car. So what they've been able to do here with this, this weird looking vehicle is cut the drag coefficient down to something like, if I'm remembering correctly, 0.13. And that helps a lot in reducing drag, but they also reduce the cross-sectional area to the wind, which is another factor in reducing drag. I mean, look at the front tires on this vehicle and mm -hmm. look how they wrap them. And this explains why the car looks so weird. And this is why we design airplanes the way we do. Um, you can't have a house fly through the air. Right, it would be so convenient to get onto an airplane, to walk into, you know, your hotel bedroom style thing and and be able to lay down relax and watch tv in there you have to be in a tube for right. it to be in any way feasible or economical uh to fly you around the world uh using a plane and a plane 
goes high up in the air, not just so we don't have to look at them or anything. It's because the air density reduces and therefore reduces drag and therefore allows you to travel much more efficiently around the world. And this is why SpaceX is developing rockets that'll go up outside of the atmosphere where there's no air. And so if you want to have a vehicle that's on the ground, there are two ways that you can reduce the drag on the vehicle. One is that you can get rid of the atmosphere around you which is Hyperloop, mm -hmm. or you can make a vehicle that is extraordinarily efficient, like Aptera. And most people buy a vehicle, and they don't really have the pockets to dig themselves an evacuated <laughs> tube right. through the earth, and they don't really have the space or the money to, uh, you know, build themselves a giant airstrip everywhere they want to go and, and buy a plane that they then have to take off and service. That's a huge pain in the butt. So the better solution would be to have a vehicle that can sit on the ground, but is as aero efficient as possible. In fact, that's where the name Aptera comes from. In Greek, it is wingless flight. Which is funny because we are actually saying Aptera wrong. We should be saying a Terra because a uh, pterodactyl, the reason it starts with a P is it's because it's pterodactyl. Oh, right. And helicopter is helioco pater. Interesting. So, yeah, it's it's the Greek thing. So, so we should be saying Aptera? Aptera, wingless flight. Interesting. But I think we can all call it Aptera. Just a little scholarly thought. To give you some idea of how much energy efficiency they've been able to squeeze out by making this crazy shaped car, let's look at what some comparable electric cars use for energy to go a mile. So, for instance, the Audi e-tron. It uses 460 watt hours per mile. Now, I know what you're saying. I don't know what a watt hour is. Uh, what about MPG? Can't we just talk? Well, since we're dealing with electricity, watt hour is a unit of energy. Let's say that you have a light bulb that's 460 watts and you run it for an hour. You would have used 460 watt hours. Conversely, you could have had a one hour watt light bulb and used it for 460 hours and that is 460 watt hours or you could take a audi e-tron drive it for one mile and it would use 460 watt hours now to give you some perspective on other vehicles the tesla model x uses about 380 watt hours per mile so it's more efficient and the model 3 uses even less it uses 230 watt hours per mile all right so what does the aptera use it is going to use an estimated less than 100 watt hours per mile so that is significantly less than half of what a model 3 uses to drive one mile yeah which is crazy because the model 3 is currently the most efficient electric car on the road. And so you might be saying, well, that's great. Efficiency, I love efficiency. That means uh, good things. It actually means more than just that. It means four specific important things. The first one and the thing that I think gets overlooked the most is that it is going to charge faster. Wait a minute. How is that possible? Right, you go to a supercharger, say in your Tesla Model 3, and you plug in and you get 150 kilowatts and you go, boy, howdy, this is fast. But let's say for a moment that you have uh, three cinder blocks hanging out at the back of your car with chains on the ground. And so when you drive around, it's going <laughs> and uh, you're not being very efficient. So when you come back to the supercharger, the miles of range that you're putting in the car for a unit of time is going to be significantly impacted. OK, but I hear a lot of people saying and my brain is even saying if you put 150 kilowatts into a car, it doesn't matter what car it is or what you're doing with it. That's how fast you're charging. Well, let's bring it back to something we've all grown up with, right? You put gas in a tank, right? So let's say we get a big giant uh, Hummer and it gets five miles per gallon. You're sitting there at the pump and it takes a minute to put a gallon in the tank. Ding, ding, ding. They don't ding anymore, but you're putting a gallon in the tank. You can only go five miles okay. with that one gallon. Oh, and it took you a minute to put the gallon in. Right. Now let's uh, oh, pull in I'm a hybrid. It. it can go 50 miles per gallon. So you put in that one gallon, it can now go 50 miles. So you charged faster, you refueled faster. The mileage, gotcha. because what, what really matters when you're charging an electric vehicle- Is the efficiency. If you had a vehicle that was infinitely efficient and you could essentially put a AA battery into it and it would be able to drive you a thousand miles, gotcha. that would be wonderful because then you just have to basically plug it in Unplug it and okay, we're ready to go, folks. And, and this is why the big auto manufacturers aren't helping themselves because they're not getting any more efficient with their vehicles like the Audi e-tron. And so they can't charge faster. Right. It has a direct impact on how useful the vehicle is. Oh, and, and this is interesting because that means that the other manufacturers have to go to like 800 volt and higher voltage to get 
more kilowatts in to get faster charging, as opposed to better efficiency, which would actually be a better way to do it. Right. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute because it's even better than what we're talking about now. Okay. And uh, two, three, and four on this list all kind of go together. The weight is lower because in order to make an efficient vehicle, you need to have uh, less rolling resistance. And, and one way you can do that is to make the vehicle lighter. Oh, right. They're using a composite body. Right. And the less stuff you put on the vehicle, the smaller uh, cross-sectional area you can have. Uh, so that works out well. And because you're using less stuff, well, you can make the cost lower uh, because there's less stuff that you need to buy to put on the vehicle. Right. And the range is higher for a particular amount of battery cells in the vehicle because, well, you had to, you have to move less weight. It's more aerodynamic and that means you need less batteries. And then and that makes it even cheaper. So you're kind of like spiraling this vehicle back into super efficiency by every step you take to make it more efficient. You're actually making it lighter, cheaper and higher range. And so with this increased efficiency, Aptera is able to offer a lower starting price. I mean, that's, you know, we can talk about cost all we want, but we need to get the cost of the car actually cheaper. So check this out. Their starting price is $26,000 for a car with a range of 250 miles. And if you've been paying attention to EVs at all, you know that that beats the Model 3 in both range and price for the standard range. Now Model you might 3. be saying, now you might be saying, but wait, you didn't beat the range of the Model 3. But Aptera does offer a model for $34,600, has a slightly bigger battery, that gives them a range of 400 miles, which is better than the Model 3 in range and better than the Model 3 in price. And if you're like, well, but 400 miles, ho-hum, they have a version that goes 1,000 miles. It costs $47,000, but it travels 1,000 miles on a single charge. And that 47,000 I believe is before federal and state tax credits, which Aptera has not maxed out like Tesla has. So, uh you could get the tax credit which would lower the price. So, you're saying that the the base model, the $26,000, that's before incentives. Yeah, we don't know yet if it qualifies for the full uh, you know, car tax incentive because we don't know yet if this is like in the motorcycle class or like what class this is. Mm -hmm. So we haven't gotten full information from Aptera about that. I think they're still working with the government on that. But once we hear, it could mean that you could get the full $7,500 tax credit. It's possible. Now, I would go further and I would argue that Aptera, if they can deliver, and that's a big if. I mean, we're talking about a startup company. Uh, yes, we see a car behind Steve and Chris there, but they have to still mass produce it and we have to still see if these numbers are true. But if they can deliver what they say, it should answer three out of the three biggest hangups that most people have when buying an EV. The number one thing that stops people from buying an EV is price, let's just face it. And at $27,000 before incentives, they beat the Tesla Model 3 by $8,000. And this opens up EV ownership to a huge number of people because there's this very fun statistic that if you can drop the price of a car by $5,000, you double the number of people that can afford that vehicle. So by dropping the price by $8,000, you are more than doubling uh, the number of people who can afford it. And with the tax credit, if we were to get, say, the full $7,500 federal tax credit, that doesn't even include state, that could open it up to six times the number of people who can afford a Model 3. Now, you might be saying, but well, this isn't a Model 3. It doesn't seat five. You're right. It only seats two. But the Aptera does, though, have more cargo space than the Model 3. Interesting. Interesting. Um, but so, yeah, if you were looking for a car that would seat your whole family, this probably is not the car for you. But if you're looking at a car to mainly get you around town, you know, and get to work, this could be your car. So the second number one problem that people have with EVs is range anxiety, right? I mean, that's one of the biggest problems EVs have is that they don't quite match what gas cars have today. The average gas car has a range of over 400 miles. And no one's been able to do that yet. But Aptera has an affordable 400 mile range vehicle and you can even get one with a thousand miles of range, which pretty much shuts up any argument about, well, it would have to have a range of some <laughs> number of miles. No, ga there's hardly any gas cars that have a range of a thousand miles. Right. The most I've heard of is about 700. And that's with a hybrid and, you know, that's pretty intense. And the third biggest hang up that most people have with EVs is where am I going to plug it in? It's the most efficient. Uh, if you if you look at your energy consumption, you know, there's uh, what, 32 kilowatt hours and a gallon of gasoline, something like that. Uh, so you figure average car burns a couple of gallons of gas a day, that energy equivalent. Well, do you want to 
put it at home and then store it at home and then also move it to your vehicle or do you just want to store it in your vehicle and use it for your vehicle? You could still have solar cells on your home, but the idea that you have your store, you need your storage device anyway on the vehicle. So why not make the most use of it? Uh, number one. Number two, in a typical vehicle, like a, gosh, like a Tesla or a Bolt even, I mean, you're, the, diff, the energy differential that you're gonna capture from solar is so little compared to the energy needs of the vehicle. So it almost, it's inconsequential. This vehicle, however, it can really move the needle. Yeah, so they broke Elon's law, right? Don't put solar panels on a car. Well, they broke it for a good reason. And the reason is with a car this efficient every day by getting maybe 40 miles of range, you may never have to plug in this vehicle other than maybe an oddball case. And I think another thing is that most people, you know, if they have an EV and they're thinking, okay, I'm gonna run out of range and then I'm gonna be stuck somewhere. With the Aptera, you could run out of range, be on the side of the road, and then just kind of wait like a day. And then you'd be like, oh, I finally have enough to be able to drive uh, somewhere else. As opposed to, oh, I still don't have any cell service. It's day five. Uh, and, and that's true of a gas car, too, if you run out of gas. I, I would argue you could probably wait an hour and drive four miles to, you know, the nearest uh, town. Uh, no, I mean, it's you're absolutely true. And it's so light. You can just get out and kind of kick it. It's so efficient. Yeah, it, that's insane. And I want to just go back to stressing about uh, charging infrastructure because yes. we talk about that a lot on the channel. Um, in order to get all of these cars with, you know, 100 kilowatt hour batteries to charge, we need supercharger level uh, installations. And that's a lot of infrastructure. But the Aptera, you can actually just plug it into a regular 120 volt outlet. And let's just do some math here to see what you could actually get by doing that. And let's just be clear, you can do this with a Model 3 as well, you can do it with a Model X, right? I have a Model 3, I primarily charge it with a 110 outlet uh, that's on the side of my apartment. So, totally works for me, but I do have to charge it up overnight and I only get around 60 to 70 miles. The Aptera charges much, much, much faster, not because it's drawing more electricity, it's because it can get more out of that electricity. Yeah, let's talk about charging in terms of miles per hour. So the Aptera on a regular household outlet here in the States, in using less than the full capacity of that outlet, just using, let's say, 12 amps, would get how many miles per hour? 14.4 miles an hour. Now, you might be saying 14.4 miles an hour. That doesn't sound very fast. I mean, supercharging can be, you know, hundreds of miles an hour. Uh, so what are you guys getting so excited about? Well, my Model 3, plugged into a 110 outlet, gets about five miles an hour. And my Sparky Model X only gets about three miles an hour. So... 14 miles an hour, if you multiply that out over the span of one night, let's say 10 hours, that's over 144 miles out of a 110 outlet. But let's say we go to lunch somewhere that has a level two charger. And in my Model X, I would be able to charge at about 17 miles an hour. So over a one hour lunch, I could go another 17 miles. How far could you go in your Model 3? I could go about 28 miles. Okay, how far, if someone pulled in next to us in an Aptera, how far could they go after an hour? They could go 66 miles. <laughs> that's crazy. With one, and that's level two, right? These are pretty ubiquitous all over the place. 66 miles an hour is Pretty fantastic if you need to spend any length of time anywhere. All right, let's say we go to a mall and we plug into a 50 kilowatt Chademo DC fast charger. Right, now we don't know if Aptera can use Chademo. It might be doing CCS. We do know that it is DC fast charging capable, but we know that many stations uh, do both CCS and Chademo at 50 kilowatts. Let's talk about the charging speeds there. So it would be able to charge my Model 3 at 217 miles an hour. That's awesome. Pretty great. Sparky would only get about 131 miles an hour. And the Aptera would get 500 miles an hour. Now that's supercharger speeds. That's beyond supercharger speeds for say a Model X because a Model X gets that kind of uh, charging rate only really at the peak of charging at a capable charger with all the conditions right. The Aptera is getting those speeds at a lowly 50 kilowatt charger. Well, there's kind of an issue that comes up when a business is looking to install a charging spot. Uh, you might be saying, well, that's wonderful that a business might be thinking of doing that. Why aren't there more businesses that have level two chargers around? And that's because it takes quite a bit of electricity to charge up a electric Parking car. lot full of cars. <laughs> exactly. If you want to put in 
you know, let's say one or two charging spots, you're talking about a big circuit that you need to talk to the landowner about and say, hey, we might need to put in more electricity. It can cost thousands and thousands of dollars, not for the charger, but just for the line in from the grid to power that charger and to and to charge that vehicle. And then there's the whole question that the landowner is going to have about, well, who's going to pay for the electricity? Right. Compare that to the Aptera, which could charge off of a regular 110 plug. It wouldn't be pulling that much energy. Or charging off the sun. I mean, let's not forget. Let's look at their solar options here. So, for instance, uh, if you put solar on the roof of it, you get 16 miles a day. On the hood, six miles a day. And on the hatch, 18 miles a day for the total of 40 miles a day. So you could have a business with hundreds of employees parked in the parking lot. And on a sunny day, they're all charging for free with no infrastructure because the sun is your nuclear fusion reactor. And that, I think, is one of the most amazing parts of Aptera and something that the press really isn't going to pick up because no one in the press has ever driven an electric car, let's face it. And if they have, they've maybe been to a supercharger, but they don't fully understand all of the nitty gritty ins and outs of it. Um, we do and, and probably you do as well, especially if you've driven an EV for any length of time. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the looks, yeah. the design. For many people... The majority of people, I would argue, uh, I'm going to assume that the design is going to be a no-go. Now, I know that when I first saw the Aptera, I didn't mind the futuristic look, but I thought, oh, to get that range, it'll have to be slow. And here is again where the design of the Aptera, ignoring the way it looks, has a huge benefit. This is not a slow vehicle. As Chris explained, the Aptera can go faster. Yeah, it's, uh, it's electromechanically limited at 100 miles an hour. Uh, 110, you can creep up to. Uh, downhill, you can go faster, though. It's so it's, just, a, it's, not a, it's not a limiting vehicle. I think right. a lot of people have seen the Aptera in videos or in pictures, and first they think it's small. It's, it's not small. It's as, it's as long as a Prius and as wide as a Model S. Uh, then they think, oh, well, it must be limited in speed or something. Maybe it's like a 45-mile-an-hour vehicle. No, it's zero to 60 and pin your head back, and it's 100 miles an hour on the freeway. So... You know, I, I, I hope that we can get across to people as they learn more and more about us that uh, this is not a compromised vehicle. Just because you're able to get free power from the sun and you're able to get a thousand miles range, you can still live a comfortable life in your vehicle and have something that's peppy and fun to drive and something that's not small. So there's two versions of the Aptera. Front wheel drive, which can go zero to 60 in 5.5 seconds, which, which is the same speed as my Model 3. And the all wheel drive, which can go zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds, which is close to a performance Model 3. Because this is so light. And it can get up to 100 miles an hour where they electronically limit it. Right, because it probably would start to take off at that point. So this kind of really breaks the expectations of what a, a efficient electric vehicle can be because we haven't really had anything like this before, aside from Tesla. Well, but again, we're we're talking about even more efficient than Tesla. Why haven't we? I mean, why hasn't all these big auto companies figured out what they figured out? This little startup figured out how to make this efficient car. Why can't Ford or BMW figure this out? I think the, the thing that's different also, though, is that Tesla made electric vehicles seem normal and even desirable. Whereas even until a couple years ago, uh, the OEMs who still make gasoline vehicles that are also making compliance or compliancy feeling electric vehicles, you can tell just by driving it, by getting in it, you know, they, their heart's not in it. They're, it's, they're, they're torn emotionally. You know, they make SUVs, they make electric vehicles, they make hybrids. They, what are they making? They don't know what they're making. But Tesla has a very clear focus. They're making electric vehicles and they do that very well. And so companies like Aptera or Tesla or other people just in the electric vehicle space have a really clear idea of what it takes to make something desirable and efficient and, and to give you freedom and to surprise you and delight you. Whereas the other companies, uh, the traditional companies, I think are sort of struggling existentially to understand who they are, what they even want to make. What really frustrates me is for the amount of work that Aptera has done, I feel like another car company could have done this. I mean, let's talk about the BMW i3, right? It's this feat of engineering. It's made out of carbon fiber. They went to the to great lengths to make it as efficient as possible, right? They put on uh, skinny tires. They they made it all out of carbon fiber. And yet, as efficient as possible, though, I think they said, stop right there. We have to keep the BMW grill. Right. And the BMW shape. So they made a box with four wheels and 
it didn't get that great a range. I mean, we drove one. It had about 60 miles of range. And then, you know, you could get a range extender option. For as efficient as it was, it didn't cover most people's needs. You don't make it high up in senior management and those companies for taking big risks. The automotive industry, is, as we've experienced it, I mean, we've, we've dealt with these manufacturers with tier ones. They're the antithesis of risk. And so you, you can't imagine someone who's climbed up their career through that ladder to be comfortable with something that looks so different. You know, they would do clinics and studies and they would rationalize why it wouldn't work and, and this and that. I think the i3 actually was pretty bold for a company like BMW, but the problem is uh, if you look at what drives sales of electric vehicles, if you plot all the sales per month of, and per year of every electric vehicle sold in the US versus all the metrics you can think of, the most correlating metric is range. And the i3 didn't deliver. And so they, they moved very few units and so they might look at it as a failure. So uh, we're gonna blow range out of the water. But I think I think the traditional companies, just what you said, they, they have a, uh, an ethos, a way of thinking that uh, it's just aligned with different factors. It's not aligned with efficiency. I think the reason that they have this inertia in the automotive companies today is because of years of cheap gasoline. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer by training and I've often counseled younger engineers, you know, the, the hardest thing and the best thing to do also paradoxically is to find a way to remove a component, remove a line of code, uh, remove a sensor, don't bloat the system, but make it smaller, do more with less. I mean, consider how few clock cycles they had on the Apollo lander as it you know, did the calculations to match the radar trajectory and land on the moon and compare that to your iWatch, your Apple Watch. People, engineers especially, become accustomed to, to gloat and comfort and an excess of resources. And so when you have this new constraint, in this case, electricity, specifically from batteries, because batteries are, are such a, a scarce resource because they're so pricey, it forces you to think different. But if you come from the mentality where gasoline is cheap, you know, your thought as well, more fuel in the tank, bigger batteries, and, and let's stuff more batteries in there. I think it, it has to, the, the thinking has to change to a more resource constrained thinking, uh, because then you, you find new and novel ways to deliver the same freedom, the same fun, and practicality, but with less resources, less energy. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point that I think a lot of us thought, well, BMW tried their best. I mean, they use carbon fiber, they redesigned the car so that the doors open in this weird new way. Right. So if it, guys, it's innovative, that's right? That's the best that you can do. That's, right? I mean, it's the- 60 miles. The best company, car company in the world, and they're the most innovative. They, they tried, and that's the most innovative thing I've ever seen. Right, so I mean, it's I got can, skinny tires. <laughs> they did everything they could, right? No, I, they didn't. They didn't do what Chris and Steve did, which right. was to go back to first principles and say, wait, air is our big problem here. Let's figure that out. I really liked that both Steve and Chris now have a lot more experience running companies. I think that that brings, you know, when I look at a company and I'm thinking of investing them or buying a car from them, I look to their leadership and I say, okay, this guy's really smart or this woman's really smart, but do they have what it takes to get this car company off the ground? The fact that these guys have both brought other IPOs to market and have done other interesting businesses that have been successful tells me that they've also got the, the business chops to possibly get Aptera off the ground. But here's what they have to say about moving on to the production phase of Aptera. Yeah, you know, Steve and I have great experience uh, scaling companies, uh, me with my boat company over many years, and uh, now uh, Flux Power, which just recently took public to the NASDAQ, um, you know, about six months ago. So, um, you know, we've taken uh, great world changing ideas and turned them into reality. And, you know, now that we have so many, have so many orders on the Aptera, you know, we have a lot of people expecting us to deliver uh, very quickly. And to automotive standards, uh, that's a challenge because testing and validation uh, just takes time. But, um, you know, our investors have been generous, um, you know, beyond compare and we can, we can only be so, so thankful for them. Uh, and we're opening up a new investment round uh, here in February to also allow, you know, any, any person out there really to invest in uh, Aptera and follow on our journey. And uh, we think that that's enough money to get us into production uh, by the end of 2021. Um, it's got to happen quickly uh, and we're going to keep pressing towards that. But uh, Elon's right. Uh, production is hell. Um, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of manpower, and it's a very different skill set 
than kind of the early prototyping and architecture phase. Um, you know, it takes a totally different skill set. So we've been lucky enough to engage companies like uh, Monroe and Associates, and they are helping us uh, with, you know, uh, validating all of our parts for production, and then also helping us build assembly lines that can scale very easily. So I think we've got a great team um, coalescing around us, and, uh, you know, very soon we can start executing on that path. So there's there's a, a globe, not only a global supply chain, but a, a global resource bank for us now that didn't exist 10 years ago and Monroe is helping us navigate that. So, you know, when we go to sleep here at night, there's people in different parts of the world working on different components of this vehicle. Work never really stops. Uh, that didn't exist when we first started the company. And so that lets us stretch our dollar by, you know, almost a factor of 10 and sometimes. And so um, the, the systems that are available to us are different. A lot of the things that we had to struggle to even ideate exist now. Uh, and we have this sort of global resource reach that Monroe is helping us with that we didn't have access to before. So those are the, the things that are really helping us uh, put this into production. All right. So what do Chris and Steve have to say to the naysayers? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the Uptera won't be for everyone. And if everyone loved it, we would probably have a problem. <laughs> um, you know, it's a polarizing design and it's a design dictated by science, not a design dictated by a uh, group that did market surveys and went out and drew pictures for people of, you know, the next Camry. It is, you know, really a vehicle born of the science of efficiency. And uh, some people, because I've heard it, uh, have a very visceral dislike for the shape. And it's three wheels. They can't wrap their head around. It's just not going to happen. But we think that a lot of people will see it for what it is, a, a, a great solution for some of our energy usage problems. And we, you know, having done this uh, over a decade ago, um, we thought that the whole industry would be like this now. We thought that all the vehicles would look like this uh, in 10 years. I mean, that was our dream. And, uh, you know, 10 years have passed since our last effort, and we have big SUVs for electric vehicles now. We have, you know, EVs coming to the market today that are going to use an average of six to 700 watt hours per mile. So they're going to have to have 200 kilowatt hour battery packs. Oh, we could go 2,000 miles on that same energy. So, you know, we think that as an industry, things are being pushed in the wrong direction. And we would love to see them pushed in a more efficient direction, more aerodynamic, lighter weight, efficient powertrain. So that's what we're bringing to market. And we hope that people love it. And some people won't, and that's fine. <laughs> well, and I think that that's really interesting. I mean, yeah, you could have this idea of a car in your mind, and you want it to, oh, I want it to look like a Mustang, and I want it to be like a Mustang, and it, uh, okay. Uh, and, well, why do we have Mustangs? It's because fuel was just the cheapest thing in the world. It's kind of like, uh, you know, trust fund kids who are just like, I don't understand what money costs, and oh, I crashed my daddy's car again, oops. You know, and they're just wasting money left and right. And you're just like, what is wrong with you? Right. How does that keep working? Right. Because they don't know the value of money, just like we don't know the value of energy because we've been on Mother Earth's, uh, you know, I've been on Mummy's, uh, you know, trust fund oil thing, right. you know, and oh, the money's running out and we don't know what to do with it. Chris and Steve do know what to do with it. They're, they're saying we can't be on oil. We can't be on, you know, daddy's trust fund for the rest of our lives. Right. We need to uh, buck up. We need to have a, an energy budget and we need to follow it. And I'm just going to say we're signed up to get one because we want to show you guys whether this car can deliver. And, and that's the big question. I mean, let's be honest. On paper, the numbers look great. Big question is how will this car look in person? Will you just feel like this is too weird for me to get into? Or will you feel like, wow, this is the future. I'm George Jetson here. Right. And will you even care? Because right. this car, you might buy the car and not have to pay for fuel, for oil changes, for pretty much anything probably besides the tires. Right. Can, can you imagine? Like I have a, a Model 3, right? And it's saving me a bunch of money. I think that I'm paying one-sixth for fuel uh, than I did with, with my previous vehicle. But now all of a sudden... I'm going to be paying uh, one fourth of that. Right. If if I don't have any sun, if I'm living underground, it would be one fourth the cost of what I'm paying for my Model 3. With the sun, 
I might never need to plug it in. I might never need to pay for charging. What does that do to my budget? How? What amount of freedom does that give me uh, that we haven't even experienced yet? Yeah, I just love that this answers those three biggest doubts and questions that EV buyers have. And the fact that you could maybe get into this car cheaper than any other car. So for those of you out there who are like, well, you're just Tesla fanboys. Well, no, we're EV fanboys. It's only that Tesla has been the only company up until now who could deliver. But if this company can deliver, I'm going to be an Aptera fanboy. So here's the thing. Just like Tesla, they're offering a referral program. So if you'd like to use our referral and get $30 off your pre-order, so basically pre-order a car for 70 bucks, head on over there now and get in line um, and use our referral link. And the link will be down in the show notes below. It'll be the first link that you can click on. I highly urge you. I mean, we're going to be getting the car probably before anyone else. We're going to be putting it through its paces and we're going to be honest because we're going to be buying a dang car. So we can tell you if it's good or if it, you know, oh, <laughs> all the wheels fell off. You know, We can tell you that stuff. I kind of think it's not fair. Remember when we did the referral program for Tesla and uh, people who helped us get a Roadster would get a ride in the Roadster from mm -hmm. us. Why don't we give people who help us to get an Aptera get a ride in the Roadster? Okay. All right. So, yeah, use our Aptera referral code. And uh, if you end up getting an Aptera and use our code, uh, you'll be able to get a ride in the Roadster. Okay. That. That sounds pretty I mean, fair. butts and seats. That's the whole point here. No, absolutely. So if you've watched this in depth and you're interested in Aptera and you want to learn a little bit more, we did an entire interview with uh, Stephen Chris, the, the co-CEOs of Aptera. And you can watch that entire interview over on the Disruptive Investing channel. So I highly urge you to go check it out. Uh, we'll put the link down below, below our referral code. So you can go to the Disruptive Investing channel. I highly urge you to subscribe. We have uh, we've a giant list of people that we're uh, thinking of interviewing uh, and it's all gonna be over on there. So if you subscribe to that channel, you'll know exactly when those videos come out. But if you wanna see them a little early, we have another way to do that. Yeah, join our Now You Know Investor Club um, over on Patreon, head over there. And for $10 or more a month, you can join our Investor Club where we hang out with these people. Like we're probably gonna have Steve and Chris talk to you privately on the Investor Club so that you can ask questions. And the reason you might wanna ask questions is they're gonna do another crowdfunding round in February and we'll be able to kind of walk through that on our investor club because a lot of people are going to have questions like, should I invest in these guys? Should I not? And we're going to know a lot about them. Because here's the thing. Tesla seemed like a crazy idea back in 2010 when they IPO'd at $17 a share. Oh, that's pre-split. Pre-split. Do the math. That's $3.40 a share, which means that that's over a 200 times return. So if you had invested $10,000 in 2010 in Tesla, this... IPO, you would have $2 million today. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that Aptera is going to have the same, uh, you know, meteoric growth as Tesla, but it is an EV company, uh, which I think- With some first principal CEOs <laughs> with experience. Which uh, kind of gives Tesla a run for its money. I mean, of course it doesn't have a giant frunk uh, like most of the Teslas do, but I would argue that the whole reason for the frunk being there was to give you a vehicle that looked like your gas car right. so that it wasn't too much of a stretch for you to be like, I'm going electric and I'm going to be driving a spaceship that looks like an Aptera. Yeah, I want to go to the looks for a second here again, because that is probably the number one factor that will keep people from even considering this car. And some people might go, well, why don't they just make it look better? Why don't they just make airplanes look like hotels? <laughs> It's because it doesn't work. The design will have to look something like this if you want to make an efficient, a super efficient vehicle. Right. They've been able to do something that I don't think a lot of other companies have been able to do. They've been able to make a pretty good looking design for dealing with the physics engine that we live in in this uh, simulation. I am super excited to get into an Aptera and actually experience how it drives, how it handles, does it do what a car should do? And I think that that's what we're hopefully gonna bring to you is does it function the way you need a car to function? Cause let's be honest. I mean, if a car does what you need it to do, who cares what it looks like? And to go one step further, things that look crazy today don't always look crazy tomorrow. How many people talked about the way that Tesla looks when they did their, their refresh, right? And we're like, no grill, that's crazy. And now we don't even give it a second thought. Right, and, and look at the horseless carriage. They, they went out of their way to call it the horseless carriage because it was a carriage without any horses? 
What? I think that we could be looking back at the Aptera in the same way that we were looking at horseless carriages. Or, I mean, look at a flip phone today. You see that and you're like, I thought that was cool. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll be looking at whatever we have in our pockets today and be going, that's what you thought was cool? A rectangle? <laughs> you thought a rectangle was neat? This thing fits into my <laughs> brain. Yeah, design is changing fast. And so the Aptera may look futuristic now, but it might look just normal in the future. And I hope it does because this could be a huge huge factor in reducing the effects of climate change. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if it did take off. If a lot of people loved the look, they could produce them cheaply, then charging infrastructure wouldn't be that big a deal because nope. the sun would take care of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the most efficient way to, to do anything. Exactly. So uh, that's why we're so excited about this company. If they can pull it off, I'm not saying it's easy, uh, it would be an amazing feat. We hope you enjoyed this episode of In Depth. If you liked it, please hit the like button and share it with your friends. I mean, I'm sure you have at least one friend who would be kind of interested in a kooky looking car like this. Um, or an like, investment like this. Uh, exactly. Um, and subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. We come out with content like this all the time and we would hate for you to miss it. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next week. Now, now you know. know.